Amen. Would you say with me, God is good? God is good. All the time. All the time. Praise the Lord. Now let's talk amongst yourselves. Oh, whose place are we going for dinner today? Right, right. Praise the Lord. Did somebody say something about dinner? Or yeah, we had to buy the where we could all go. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I thought I heard. Leroy has become quite a cook. <laughs> <laughs> what is he saying? <laughs> makes good jello. <laughs> he does. What I'm doing now, folks, is uh, turning all the. Uh, turning on the. Uh, Facebook. We have folks who watch us through Facebook and we're just <clears throat> delighted to have them. <coughs> Praise God. Make sure your face is standing. Yeah. <laughs> Get your hair about tiresome looking at it. We're all, I noticed, uh, I think it was Thursday, that. Uh, I went to the piano and I took this with me because I thought uh, rather than just having them hear somebody singing, they could see me. I set it on the, uh, whatever that's called there, that holds the music for us. And uh, when it came through, when I looked at it later, you could see the top of my head right like this. <laughs> and then your ear during your sermon. What's that? Then your ear during the sermon. Oh, and then my ear during the sermon. So I, yes, I noticed that also. So I've tried to make it a little more uh, accessible to you folks who are going to be watching on I Facebook. Wrote a, I wrote a note to you as you, you were first starting and said, step back a little bit. You're not, you know. And then, of course, you didn't read it because you were great. Uh, yes. I, so I was then great. I took it off. Oh, okay. I think we're okay here now. It looks good uh, from my viewpoint anyway. Praise God. Well, the Lord is so good and precious to us. And there are times when we, as human flesh, we back off a bit and we think, oh, does God really care? Does God really understand? Does God really hear me? Uh, what is the problem? Why am I not receiving what I have requested of the Lord? And on and on that goes. Now, if you haven't had those kinds of things come into your mind, then you are most fortunate. Thank God for that. But for the most of us, I think we have those times of doubt and fear, anxiety, wonderment, and... Uh, so this morning, I, I, want to, uh, I, I want to present to you what God presented to me uh, as an answer to that dilemma. And uh, we're going to be talking from 2 Chronicles, the uh, second chapter, or the 20th chapter, rather. Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. Now, if you're looking for Chronicles... It's, it's on page 608, yes. You're coming through in purple and green only. In the phone, we watch you in uh, Facebook. Or you're watching me on Facebook. Yeah, and it's I'm only coming. in tones of purple and green. And I'm coming through as purple and green. Uh, is that bad? Well, <laughs> it's good your name, I guess it. It's purple. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everything looks good from, from where I'm standing. Okay. Maybe at the end of it, perhaps. Uh, you are you you are speaking to a man who is technologically challenged, and so. Uh, it's like yes, a light come from heaven. <laughs> is there alien? Is there a light problem, perhaps, or? You have your... No, it's good now. It's good. It's perfect. It's good now. Good. Mm -hmm. it's, good now. It's, good. it's good now, so perhaps it was just... Yes, ma'am? Okay. I'm sitting here seeing Paul watching you on Facebook. No, I'm watching you. Oh, okay, oh, maybe you're not, but he, he and Betty are watching you. Yep. Does that not weaken the Wi-Fi signal for here? 
does that and I'll make it harder for him. Not the new one. Not the new one. We got five. We got new one. We got five. Now, you folks who are watching us on Facebook, we're just uh, we're just getting started here with uh, some technical issues, and uh, we're ready to go. I think now. I'm so thankful for the folks who watch us on Facebook. Uh, in, in spite of our little issues that we have at this uh, point, thank you for coming to us on Facebook. We have certain folks who are not able to be among us uh, during this pandemic time because uh, of their physical uh, ailments. Uh, they are most vulnerable to this uh, 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 serious disease. And so we bless them for following us on Facebook and and uh, we thank you for taking this time to be with us this morning. Some of them don't come on until later. Many of them are, uh, many of the folks who watch us are in their own churches. And uh, we've had 41, 42 people coming on Facebook to watch the, uh, the Facebook account. And so I thank God for that. Many of whom I don't know uh, by name. And so bless them for doing that. Now, 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. We all face trials. We all have battles in our lives. Our family life, battles against temptation, against thoughts of worry and depression, battles for mental and physical health, as well as spiritual battles for another person or battles in our own lives, spiritual battles. Whatever fight we face, we can be certain that the Bible reveals key strategies to experience victory. Do you know that God wants us to live in victory? Yes. God wants us to be victorious and has laid out the plan for us to be victorious. And so uh, we're going to talk about those strategies of victory this morning. Not lengthy, and we're not going into great detail, but let's look at this beautiful portion of God's Word uh, in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. Now, just to begin this, uh, let me read the first few verses, and then I'm not going to go through the entire text because it would, it's rather lengthy. It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now, let's just stop and say this, that Jehoshaphat was a follower of God, tried to, to pattern himself after the commands of God in the New Testament. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and there in Hazan, Tamar, which is in Gedi, and Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast through all Judea. So Judah gathered together, that is the nation of Judah, gathered to, uh, together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah, they came together to seek the Lord. Uh, all right, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God our Father, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand there is not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand against you? 
Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name's sake, saying, <coughs> if disaster comes upon us, or judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before the temple of God and in your presence, for your name is in your temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save us. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Now let's just stop there for a moment and, uh, and talk about the issue at hand. Some folks came to, to Jehoshaphat and said, Jehoshaphat, we have heard that there's a great number of people, Moab, Ammonite, Syrian, a great number of folks who are coming against us. The number is beyond count. Now look, the first thing the Bible says about this man of God is that he feared. Fear entered into his mind, in his heart. And I want you to know from the outset of everything that we say today that that is the foremost trick of the enemy of your soul right. and your mind right. is to in your circumstance, whatever it is, where you are feeling anxiety, where you're feeling hurt or pain, when you're feeling something that perhaps someone has said to you, like a doctor perhaps, a physician who has told you something that you really didn't want to hear. Whatever it is, the enemy, the first strike of the enemy is always fear. In 52 years of ministry, I've dealt with a lot of folks who have been to the doctor or to their physician and come to me with tears in their eyes and, and they are almost at a point of hopelessness because they are absolutely numbed by fear. The doctor said he should know. These are the facts. He showed me on paper. The problem that I am faced with. Well, I want you to know this morning that facts do not add up to faith. Right. Facts, as we've mentioned before, oftentimes is found in numerical sense, two plus two equals four, that's a fact. On the other hand, 5,000 men and probably at least another 5,000 women and children we're on a hillside in Judea listening to one man speak. That man was Jesus of Nazareth. It came time for lunch. He must have really had a long message. <laughs> it came time for lunch and the disciples came to Jesus and whispered in his ear and said, Jesus, the people were hungry. Maybe we should let them go home, eat, and come back. And Jesus said to them, well, ask amongst them, do they have anything to offer for food? And they came back with five loaves of bread, little loaves of bread, and two fish. 
They said, out of all the people, they didn't come here thinking that you were going to preach so long. <laughs> they came thinking that the service would be over by now, and nobody brought any food. But a young man said, here, I brought my lunch with me. You can have this. Amen? You know the story, I'm certain. Jesus blessed it and said, that's enough. Two fish and five loaves, that's enough. Now look, people, that doesn't add up as a fact. The fact was that five loaves of bread and two fishes would not feed at least 10,000 people. It was impossible. But how do you know that the Scripture says those things that are impossible to the human elements are possibilities in God? Hallelujah. Why? Because God does not reign by facts and figures. God does not reign by the summation of what men say. God does not live or exist to bless facts and figures. He blesses faith. He blesses this is what men say, but hold on, what does God say? The Word of God, powerful, powerful. And by faith we receive it, and we walk in it, and it brings us victory. Now, in this portion of God's Word that we read, I'm going to pick out some Scripture verses and talk about the strategic act of God toward us. That God gives us a plan to walk by whereby we can become or live in victory. Number one, in verse 12, it says, Our God will, will not judge them, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Number one, we must admit our weakness and our own limitations. When you come up against the enemy, whether it be mental or physical, whether it be in your body or in your family, whatever it is, the first thing that is required of you by God is that you release your own ego and you say, God, here I am. I will only trust you. Now look, the human flesh always does this backwards. We always have this thought in mind, well, I'm going to do whatever I can do, whatever is possible for me to do, I'm going to do that first. Now then, if that doesn't work, then I'll approach God. <laughs> I'll take the aspirin first. Amen. Uh, Ken Gull, a friend of mine in the evangelism work, so he went into a grocery store one day and he saw this woman and she was taking three or four or five bottles of aspirin and she put it into her cart. And he said, I couldn't help but ask her, what is it? You, you are taking so much aspirin. Well, she said, it's better to be safe than sorry. And so I always stock up on it just in case. God reminds us, folks, that the first thing we must do is declare and decree our weakness before Him by limitation. God, all I need is You. The Bible says in the 12th verse, but our eyes are upon You. We don't be macho. We gotta be humble. 
We've got to turn to God for his help. We may look to be all wise and all powerful. And, you know, we may think that we can do it on our own. But I'm here to tell you that God honors it when you say, Lord, I am my weakness. I am in my limitation. I need you. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now that's James 4, 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And so I might just say to you this morning, rather than making God the afterthought, perhaps in the beginning you could say, Lord, here I am. And I love you, I trust you, but in all that I have and all that I am, I need your help. Sure. The second thing is to realize that the battle belongs to the Lord. I want you, if you're following, please, to look at verse 15. Listen, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I'm sure you've heard this on several occasions. But 365 times in the Bible, that would be once for every day, amen? 365 times the Bible says, be not afraid. Why? Because that is the main angle of your enemy, is fear. He wants you to be afraid. So he says, listen, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or be dismayed. The word dismayed is anxious. Amen. Ooh, we get so anxious, we get worried. We get frazzle-dazzled. Because of the great multitude, or we could say the opposition that comes against you. Why? For the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. Glory to God. I cannot say it loud enough or more sincerely enough. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. Why? How can you say that? I'll tell you why. Because you don't belong to yourself. You belong to Him. Did you know that? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul says three times over that you are the dwelling place of Holy Spirit God. You are the place wherein God dwells. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. I don't look like it. I don't sound like it all of the time. All of that makes no difference whatsoever to God. It only makes a difference to you. And we absolutely do this all the time because this is another ploy of the enemy. The enemy will say to you, you don't deserve this. Whatever God has for you, you don't deserve the enemy says this to the Christians all the time. God cannot live in your clay house. Why? Because you don't deserve it. I'm here to tell you, you do deserve it, not because of you or your works. Ephesians, the second chapter, tells us that by grace you are saved. Grace is the unmerited favor and love of God in action in your life. For by grace are you saved, that not of yourself, it is the gift. Say with me, gift. Gift. It is the gift of God. Now you don't pay for a gift. Why would you even try? And yet, as Christians, we work so hard to be pleasing to God that, folks, is living under the law. And grace comes from the Spirit of the living God. And God says, you are not your own, for you have been bought with the price of Calvary. You see, Jesus went to the cross, 
suffered immense pain, struggle, went through all of the issues that you and I go through, anxiety, worry, fret, fear, all of those things he went through on his cross. But that's why he was there, to make an open show of all of that, which was a part of the enemy and his work against the people of God. And so he made a final work, a finished process of all of that, so that now in him, in Christ Jesus, you are free from all of that. And so when the enemy tells you you don't deserve it, you say, but I am in Christ. I live in Christ. Now look, people. Goliath. Remember Goliath in the Old Testament? Remember little David, the shepherd, who had come to bring food and, uh, from the father, from his father, to his brothers who were on the front line. And they were facing the Philistines, and big old giant Goliath stood there, and he was making fun. He was mocking Israel and Judea, Judah, and saying, come on, come on. Anybody is able to fight, you come and fight me. I'll take you on. And let's see, and whoever wins gets the prize. Amen. And so little David, full of the Holy Spirit, walked up with his sling. And the Bible says, before he did anything, David came and stood before Goliath and said, I am here to defeat you. He didn't sneak up with his little uh, stone and do this. And Goliath falls. No, no. Before anything else, he came up. Read it for yourself. It is in 1 Samuel 17, 47. Before anything else, he comes before Goliath and he said, I am here in the name of the Lord of Israel. Hallelujah. And I have come to defeat you. This, this is the answer. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that his battle was not his own. It was God's battle. It belonged to to the Lord. And he declared the victory before he ever picked up his weapon of warfare. Now look people, most of us do just the opposite. When we're in our need, when, we're, when we find ourselves in our hurt, in our pain, our anxiety, our fear, whatever it is, rises up and we begin to plead with God somehow, oh God, help me, help me, help me. Now look, I agree with what the scripture says here in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. The first thing Je 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 Jehoshaphat said to the people of Israel is get on your face and ask God you know, take a position of lowliness and ask God to help us. Now we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to say this. That it is with this idea in mind, if you can stand on the victory side instead of the victim side. Amen. Then you have half the battle won before you ever enter into the battle itself. Now look, the Bible says we release the battle to God when we, when we believe that God is going to do what he said he'll do. Amen? All right, let's go on. Position yourself in Christ. I want you to read verse 17a, the first part of verse 17 with me. It says, you will not need to fight in the battle. 
position yourself. You see that word? Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. I want you to say this morning, or see this morning, that what God is talking about is positioning yourself in Christ. You must come to this place where you realize that you are in Christ. God is not only in you, but you are in Him. And so Ephesians, the sixth chapter, tells us that we come into battle. Take on the life of Christ. Take on the full armor of God. That's the very life of Christ. Prepare yourself. Stand in Christ. Evelyn was a beautiful lady who came to our fellowship in Vancouver when I ministered there to the elderly folks. She came week after week and she had the biggest, sweetest smile on her face. And she'd come in and sit down and she'd wave at me and smile. And after the service, she'd always come to me and she'd say, Oh, Pastor, how that blessed me with her smile. Time went on when all of a sudden she was in a wheelchair and someone pushed her to the service and she still waved at me and blessed me. A little while later, she didn't show up and someone said, she has gone to the hospital and so we prayed for her. And then just a short few weeks, just maybe two or three weeks went by. And he called me and said, Pastor, would you come to the hospice place, you know, and, and, and see my mother and minister to her? And I went there. And this darling little lady lying on her back, now knowing that she only had a few days to live. And it happened that quickly, just in a matter of a couple months. Had a smile on her face and said, oh, put out her head, oh, it's so good to see you. Introduced me to her daughters who had come from Tennessee and, and, and so I ministered to her and she, her sense of humor was just delightful. I ministered to her and with her daughters. I left, came back several times over a period of a week or two. The same reception always, even though I could tell that she was, you know, on drugs. She knew who I was just by my voice, and she'd always lift out her hand and hold her hands with me. The day before she transitioned from glory to glory, from this life to that, she said to her daughters, bring all the children. I want to see all my grandbabies and mother. How can we do that? They can't come into the room. She said, there's a, a big room across the hall. We could meet there. They called the family together the next day. They called the family together. And they met in this, um, in this congregational room. And here she came in the wheelchair. And she had pictures with a big smile on her face with all of her grandchildren and with her children. And there were a bunch. And she took pictures with every one of them, smiling, waving, sometimes holding them in her arms. I mean, this was a weak woman. Following day after that, she went on to her heavenly reward. And when I ministered at her funeral, 
I said this of her, if in my lifetime I shall find anyone else who was absolutely content and happy, this woman never, ever, ever gave me any indication that she was worried or she was upset or she was anxious, nothing. She always just said, praise the Lord. <laughs> if I am able to find one other, I will rejoice in Christ Jesus. Because I'll tell you what this did for me. It made me realize <coughs> that in the midst of the worst of situations, God is in control. Amen. She was in Christ Jesus. And she could say to the enemy of her soul, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of passing on. I'm not afraid of hurt or pain. I'm not afraid of anything. I am ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. She left a whole room of lovely children and, and, and daughters and a son who were weeping. Oh, mama, I don't know. Amen. As we all do. But she was okay. She was just fine. That's because it is in Christ. The Bible says we are, Romans 8 chapter, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, how can you be more than a conqueror? Isn't a conqueror enough? No, no. But Paul was saying, hey, a conqueror, we don't have to work for it. We don't have to be in the battle. We don't have to engage. Jesus has already engaged. He's already won the battle. All things have been given up in him. And every power, every dominion, and every might is underneath his feet. And if I am in Christ Jesus, then I am more than a conqueror. Because I don't have to fight the battle. I can just find myself secure in him no matter what's happening. The Bible says now, look at this verse 18 and 19, and I'm just about ready to conclude this message, so hang with me for, for a moment. The Bible in verses 18 and 19 says that Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah bowed before the Lord, look at this, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites, they were the ones who God appointed to minister the spiritual things to the people. Then the Levites stood up to praise the Lord of Israel with voices loud and high. I've had people say, do you have to be so loud? Yeah, I do. I do. Because I get so thrilled with Jesus. And with all these glorious possibilities, they worshipped the Lord. I'm telling you that the word worship literally means, in the Hebrew, literally means to surrender completely to. Mm -hmm. To surrender to Him. To surrender to God. They worshipped the Lord. They gave up all of their own power and their own, uh, their, their own will. And they said, Lord, we delight in you. Hallelujah. So many people come for a touch from God, for healing or for blessing from God. But God isn't on the throne just to bless us or to give us healing. God is on the throne to see to it that we begin to operate in the divine structure of God and we begin to move and work in Him. And the beginning to all of that is just to surrender to Him. Unless you have, unless you've surrendered to God, you do not possibly know the joy and the satisfaction of giving to God. Probably the hardest thing for most of us to do is to step out of ourselves 
and begin to identify with him, begin to operate with him, to simply say, God, you are all I need. I don't need healing. I don't need blessing. You are what I need. Hallelujah. And how many know that he will not hold back any good thing from those he loves, who walk in his purposes. Hallelujah. That's what the word of God says. But now here comes, here comes folks, here comes the banner, here comes the big one. Verses 20 and 21, attack your enemy with praise. God begins to speak to Jehoshaphat and he says to Jehoshaphat, here's what I want you to do. Now look. The great army of Moab are on the hillside and they can see the vast number of not one nation but at least three and possibly five different nations who have come to destroy them, to take them out of the earthly presence, to take them out altogether and they're standing on the other side. Now, the Moabites were known to be big men. You might remember when the children of Israel came to Kadesh Barnea before they entered the land of promise at the Jordan River. They sent spies over. Twelve spies went over and began to look and find out what they were up against. And they came back and said, Oh, God, these people are giants. Well, the Israelites were smaller people. So anybody I suppose six foot would be a giant to them. But now look, these are the Moabites that God left in the promised land. Why? Because they were the descendants of Esau. Remember Esau and Jacob? Mm -hmm. These were the descendants of Esau and God had promised this to Esau. God had promised a portion of his land to Esau. God also knew that Esau would rebel. That the Moabites would rebel. And this is what they were doing. Now they wanted to absolutely obliterate Israel. But look what happens. God says, this is what you must do. Find all of the best singers and the best people who can play instruments. Get all of them together and have them begin to sing and praise God. And if you want to see the real thing, you can go to uh, uh, Psalms. Let's see, I believe it's Psalms 108. Uh, let me find it here. Uh, Psalms, uh, yes, Psalms 108, and it talks about what they sang, the songs that they sang. And each time they sang a verse of song, they would say, and the mercies of God are forever. It was a merciful song. But he said, sing praises. And the, the, the instruments began to play, and the men began to sing praises unto the Lord. And they stood in front of the army. Are you with me now? And the Moabites on the other side were looking at them, saying, what in the world is this? This has got to be the silliest thing. We, we didn't come here to fight a bunch of musicians. We came here to fight warriors. And they were probably laughing and scoffing and saying, look at them. They're, they're singing and they're, they're, this is a crazy thing. How can this possibly help them? And the Bible says, as they began to praise and sing, the mercies of God are forever, as they began to praise the Lord, all of a sudden confusion came upon the enemy. And they began, the enemy began to fight each other, nation upon nation, began to fight each other and kill each other. And the only nation left was Syria. 
And they hadn't, they hadn't entered the fray yet. And the Bible says that all of a sudden they began to fight each other. They were probably trying to figure out what in the world is going on. They could hear the music. It was filling the air. The praises of God. What's going on? And they began to fight each other in confusion. And they killed each other until every last one of the enemy was dead. Now, I'm going to wrap this up and tell you that absolutely the most victorious place where you can stand is in a place of praise. When you begin to praise God in the worst of your situation, when you begin to sing praises to God, the enemy is confused. Do you hear that? Usually what we do is say, oh my God, I hate that. Oh. oh, I feel so bad. Oh, things don't look good. We get up in the morning and we say, oh God, Help me, if I can just make it through one more day, I'll be okay. Now, if you have never done that, then, then, then you don't have to listen anymore. But I personally have done that on many occasions. Oh, dear God, not another day. Amen? And God is saying to me, this is the day that I have made for you. Rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. So when I get up in the morning, I remember that God is on the throne. That the battle of today, whatever it is, how, how, how much difficulty I face, God is on the throne. And this belongs to Him because I belong to Him and everything about me belongs to Him. Can you say amen? Everything belongs to you. Now I can say, oh God, I praise you, I worship you for today. Whatever it brings, I will sing praises unto you. If you want to confuse your enemy, if you want to break the chains that bind you, I'm going to read this. I was going to have this on, on up here by Russ Taff. He was going to sing for us today. He didn't know it, but he was going to sing for us on the, on the tube. But uh, I'm not going to venture it because... I think it might take a minute for it to get there, so I'm going to give you these words. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifold schemes and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise Him. Praise the Lord. For God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord. For the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they draw powers behind you when you praise Him. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Now Satan is alive. And he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself. We're children of the king. So lift the mighty shield of faith for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ has risen and the work's already done. Praise the Lord. He works for those who praise him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they draw powerless behind you when you praise Him. How Paul and Silas were chained, bound in the prison. And they began in the midnight hour at the darkest hour of the day they began to sing praises unto God. And the Bible said suddenly their chains began to move and the chains fell from their hand and foot and the doors of the prison shook and they opened up 
And the jailer who was responsible to see that nothing happened to them or they were not able to get away fell to his knees and said, I want whatever it is that you have. I want some of it. And he said, come to my house. I want to feed you. I want you to tell me about this thing. I want you to show me what this is all about. And thus began a new ministry in the New Testament. Oh, listen to me. There's nothing on this earth like praise. Amen. And songs of praise. Sing unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord will rid your depression faster than anything you could possibly realize. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because the Bible says, Psalms David said, that God dwells in the praises of his people. And the enemy will say, what are you doing? You silly person. You're sick. You're disabled. You have a problem. What you need to do is start worrying. What you need to do is start being anxious. What you need to do is start wondering how in the world are you going to get through this thing? <laughs> but when you say, thank you, God. Oh, I love you, God. I love you. I am yours and you are mine. Hallelujah. When you start praising God, it confuses the enemy. And I'm here to tell you, it destroys the power of your enemy, no matter what it is, there is power in praise. Praise is the purest form of faith. Why? Because the Bible says praise goes before God, before an answer of prayer. Praise is before it. And as we read today in this scripture, God said, begin to preach me and watch what I do in front of you. Hallelujah. And the enemy was destroyed, not by their hands. It was the power and the work of God through praise. Hallelujah to God. You have no need to fight the battle. You are more than a conqueror when you begin to worship and praise God. Hallelujah. Every enemy will fall at our feet. I'm here to tell you, folks, We've got to turn this thing around. Instead of being victims, we need to become victors. We stand on the victim side. Oh, woe is me. We need to come over to the victory side and say, come on. It's okay. Everything's okay. Praise God. Because I am a child of the King. His royal blood now flows through my veins. Oh, I once was a pauper. Amen. But oh, now... I'm a child of the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes, I'm a child of the King. God, somehow, I don't know how it was possible, but somehow, cause us to come to that position where we don't give ourselves to our circumstances, but we stand in the place where you have called us to stand. We are positioned in Christ. We know that all things work together for them who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so cause us to be surrendered, I pray, Lord. Cause it to happen that we may glorify you. And all things will bring life and glory. Amen. 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 And so we stand with me. How? How? How many hungry people are there in the room? <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. There's only like three or four of you, so that's okay. Uh, and I can go another half an hour, but no. <laughs> I can tell one thing you're hungry for God, Amen. you're hungry yes. for the Word of God. Amen. And God has fed us this morning mm -hmm. with truth, with absolute truth. And I've asked him now that he make that truth stable and secure in your heart and mind. And as you leave this place, that you'll begin a new uh, insight, with a new insight into God's blessing and how we approach victory in Christ Jesus. 
Praise God. Thank you for giving your testimony. I don't know which one of the, which one of the, your testimony. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't know because I had my back to you, but thank you for that. God has victory for us. God said to me that young Sam, 27 years old, in an accident, a critical accident. Yes. And the Spirit of God came upon me as I was looking at this beautiful passage of God's Word and said to me, fear not. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. For I am the Lord your God. And I will do what I promise to do. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And Sam is okay. He's not just like they're waiting to be okay. In God, he is okay. Hallelujah. A few days ago, he was on a respirator. Mm -hmm. Couldn't breathe. And they said, dear Lord, he, ha he, he can't make it. God said to me, he's going to make it. And I'm here to tell you, God's word is true. And what God says he will do. Hallelujah. Because we're not of ourselves. We belong to him. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Oh, blessed Jesus. Now the girls are going to start playing something and I don't even know what they're going to play. So I'm going to sing, sing, sing. Uh -huh. Sing, sing, sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing, sing, sing.